Hi, I'm Tony Northrup for Train Signal, and in this video lesson, we're going to learn to configure Event Viewer in Windows 8. This maps to the first two sub-objectives in Objective 6.3 for the Microsoft 70-687 certification exam. In this particular lesson, we're covering how to configure and analyze the event logs and how to configure event subscriptions. Event subscriptions allow you to forward events from one computer to another, and they basically allow you to centrally manage the events in your organization. Now I'm going to give you a quick tour of all the different logs that you can see in the event viewer. There are dozens of them. So here we are on my Windows 8 computer, and I will open up the WinX menu by right-clicking in the lower left corner. And here you can see a couple of different options. You see the Event Viewer option right here. Clicking that obviously opens up Event Viewer. You also have the Computer Management Console, and the Computer Management Console contains the Event Viewer as well as just about every other tool you'd ever want. So I usually use that. It just It's like a single place, a one-stop shop for everything you need. So under the Computer Management Console and the System Tools node, you will find Event Viewer. And within Event Viewer, you have several different nodes. Custom views are for nodes that you set up yourself. Uh, you can see they provide one standard custom view administrative events. Under Windows Logs, we have these standard logs that we've been working with since Windows NT, really. Application, Security, and System. And those are pretty self-explanatory. System log is where everything goes. <laughs> so if you're ever unsure where something might be, it's probably in the system log. The security log is pretty much just for auditing success and failures. So we've covered auditing in other lessons. And if you enable auditing and somebody touches something they're not supposed to or something they are supposed to and you have success auditing turned on, you can find a record of it here. The application event log is used for Everything that's not core Windows components, though a lot of it you might actually consider to be part of Windows. So looking here, you can see there's a application event from the defrag tool, which is included with Windows. It's a feature of Windows, a component of Windows. But it shows up in the application event log because for some reason it acts like an application rather than the core system. Um, and you can see search here and when log on. Uh, lots of different parts of Windows add events to the application event log instead of the system event log. It's a little confusing. So often when you're looking for something, you'll end up looking in both the application and the system event logs. As a general rule, it's the more core stuff that you find in the system event log. So this comes from the kernel, which is the most central part of the operating system. And this event comes from the file system, new technology file system, that's NTFS and the time service. These are all really low level Windows components. And here you find events from higher level Windows components, as well as third party applications that don't necessarily make their own event log. Of course, the setup event log is pretty straightforward. It contains events about the setup of Windows and, and most of these will come when you initially set up Windows, but things like installing updates can create uh, events in here later on. And forwarded events will cover a little bit later, but this is for event forwarding where you collect events from multiple different computers. By default, this is where they'll end up. I'll jump in the system log here to show you the different types of events. The most obvious are the difference between information, warning, and error messages. I'll scroll down a little bit here to find a warning. So information, of course, has this friendly white icon. Warning gives you that yellow triangle. and it doesn't actually mean that anything is going wrong with your computer or that you need to do anything. Whether something is an information, a warning, or an error is left entirely in the hands of the application or operating system developer. So there's a developer at Microsoft who was working on the PNP, the plug and play component of the Windows kernel, and he's required to write code that adds events when important things happen to the Windows kernel. And it's basically that guy's decision whether something is considered an information event or a warning event. So there are general guidelines, but if you see a warning, it doesn't mean, oh my goodness, I need to like jump on this and figure out what this is and fix it. We'll take a quick glance at this particular event. And you can see the driver, this, I don't know what that is, failed to load 
a particular device. Um, so this could be an indication that a particular hardware component has failed or that a driver is experiencing problems. In my experience, there are a lot of these events that are indicative of a problem and you can simply dismiss them. Uh, I'll scroll down a little bit farther and see if we can find an actual error. There we go. Now this is a real error, a bug check. A bug check is more commonly known as a stop error or a blue screen. It's the biggest error Windows can experience and it means Windows had such a big error that it felt like it had to shut the whole system down. Windows performs a bug check, a stop error, a blue screen in order to protect the system integrity. Usually if Windows detects that any piece of memory changed when it wasn't supposed to, it could be because somebody's hacking into it, malware's taken over. That little bit of change could mean your spreadsheet calculates a number incorrectly and uh, screws up the uh, accounting for your company. So any sort of error like that, Windows would rather die than let happen. So it literally just shuts itself down and shows you a bug check. So that's what a bug check is. And if you ever have a blue screen and you know, I used to, when I, the blue screen would pop up, I'd grab a pen and paper and try to really quickly write down the message because it shows you these like crazy codes and um, usually some other information. Well, you don't have to sweat it. Just wait for the computer to reboot and then open up event viewer and find the most recent event with a source of bug check. And then you can get the code. It's a bit of an aside, but if you ever want to find out what's going on with a bug check, just search for this uh, two digit code here. You know, this is a big hexadecimal number, but usually it's, they just use the last two digits here. So this one is 1A. And if you search for blue screen 1A or stop error 1A, um, you'll find some information about it. And you might need to look in this dump file too to get some additional information, but sometimes this tells you everything you need. So I would just put that in a search engine and hopefully it's useful. So that's a legitimate error. Now here we see um, another lesser used event type, which is critical. And you can see that this is indeed an error. The system rebooted without a shutdown. This can happen because you lose power or because somebody pulls the plug or something critical happens on the computer, but it's a hardware thing. It's a little bit different from a bug check. So I think the single biggest challenge with the event viewer is there's so much stuff you don't care about in here. <laughs> There's all these informational things. I don't know why anybody would want to look at them. I mean, there there have been times when I've been troubleshooting something and I've had to go back and actually look at some of these events. But for the most part, the what they call in the nerd world, the signal to noise ratio or the SNR isn't very good. There's a lot of noise in here, a lot of events that you just don't care about. So one of the most important skills is learning to filter it properly. And I find this tool over here really useful, filter current log. So let's just find the critical and error messages. A fifth type that we don't see often is verbose. And verbose is like a step less important than information. So as you can see, there's a ton of useless information events in there. Verbose means somebody said, I wanna know every little bit about a Windows component and what it's doing or an application and what it's doing. And verbose is only used by developers when troubleshooting specific problems. So you'll probably never see verbose when a developer's writing an application. They'll put in little events that indicate every line of code pretty much that the application is running so they can follow exactly what's going on. And it's just a way to debug it without requiring special debugging tools. And usually verbose messages are turned off by default, but if the developer's having a problem, troubleshooting an issue with a customer, they'll tell the customer, hey, go in and go into the settings and turn on verbose messaging. And then the app will start to add verbose messages to the event log, but you don't see it under normal circumstances. So I've set up the filter current log dialog box here so that it shows only critical and error events. So let's click okay. And now we see just the bad stuff. Or if you're trying to troubleshoot a problem, maybe it's just the good stuff. You can see here we have Shadow copies were aborted because the, well, basically it reached the default limit for the size of shadow copies. That's not so much an error that happens normally. Um, the bug check we talked about, system rebooted without shutting down. Previous shutdown was unexpected. These three events are actually related to a single error that the computer had. The computer had a, a bug check and powered down and it resulted when the computer restarted, it noticed, hey, I didn't shut down properly. 
you can actually see. So these three error messages indicate exactly the same thing, basically, and, and you'll see that a lot. One particular event on the computer will result in different error messages from different sources. These three are all different sources saying, hey, we didn't shut down cleanly last time, I need to tell somebody about it. So often you'll group these together and maybe they each have a different clue for you or maybe they're just completely redundant. Now I see distributed com messages a lot. Um, com is the component object model and distributed com is just a technology that allows applications to communicate with each other either on a local computer or across a network. DCOM is basically an updated version of the old COM. And you can, I have no idea what these messages mean. Uh, nobody does. I mean, who, who knows what this GUID is? It's called a GUID. I don't know. Maybe there's some developer somewhere, but I see these distributed COM errors all the time and I've never used them for troubleshooting. They're just filling up my event log. And here we see some uh, VPN error messages from an earlier lesson that I recorded. So that's how you can find all the uh, error and criticals. Let's go in and clear that filter. And let's just find the bug checks. You can see I'm clicking the event sources list here. And this is a really effective way to find specific things. Uh, I'm just going to select bug check here and then click OK. So we can see really there was a single bug check and it resulted in two events. One, an error containing the detailed information about the bug check and the location of the memory dump file. And the other is oh, just an informational message that <laughs> it deleted my dump file. So I hope I didn't need that for troubleshooting. But you can see it was running out of disk space and these dump files take up a lot of memory. It's off topic now, but the dump files contain the entire contents of the memory of the computer at the time. So if you have two gigs of RAM, it's going to be a two gig file. And theoretically, a developer could open up that file and track down exactly what was happening at the time of the bug check to better isolate the problem. In reality, we don't do that very often, but I've definitely done it before. So there are a couple of other actions over here that I find pretty useful. I'll use this one first, which is save filter to a custom view. And when you click that, you're allowed to save your current filter as if it was another event log. So I'll just call it bug checks. And we can see here under custom views, which I showed you earlier, it created the custom view that I created. So you can filter your event with anything, for example, just critical and error events. I'll change that source. And then save it here for a quick reference later. So now you can quickly find the events that were most important to you. This is really useful if you're tracking a problem over a long period of time. For example, if there's an application that's just giving you problems, create a filter that shows just that application's events and save it as a custom view. And then the next day or the next week, when you go back to look at the events again, you can just open up the custom view and you don't have to craft a special filter every time. Now I'm going to demonstrate what I think is the coolest thing you can do with Event Viewer, and that's attaching a task to run when an event pops up. Using this, you can cause anything to happen when a particular event occurs, allowing you to automate the response to events. Here we are back in Event Viewer in Windows 8, and I've identified an event that could be pretty important. This event, Event ID 4199, only pops up when there's an IP address conflict. You can see from looking at the description here that this computer had the IP address 10.0.2.15 and something else on the network had that same IP address, and that's not allowed. No two computers on one network should have the same IP address, and that's why it's an error in the event log. Now, you could write a script that might run automatically when this happens, and that script, for example, could make sure that DHCP is configured, or reset the network stack, or do a couple other common troubleshooting things if this is a reoccurring event in your organization. If it's something you need to manually respond to, you could also write an event that simply, I don't know, sends an email to an administrator so he can respond to it. Exactly how you respond is entirely up to you. What I'll demonstrate for you is how to configure a task to run. So after selecting the event here in Event Viewer, you'll right click it and then click Attach Task to this event. 
This opens up the Create Basic Task Wizard. And you can see it gives it a default name with the event ID in it, but we'll give it a little more friendly name. And then click Next. Now you can see it's automatically configuring the log, the source, and the event ID. This uniquely identifies the event. So I'll click Next to accept those. And on the Action page here, you can see it still pops up, but you only really have one option because sending an email and displaying a message are both deprecated, which means they were supported by earlier versions, but they're no longer really used anymore. I, I used to use both of those quite a bit, but nowadays you'll need a separate program that either sends a message or sends an email, and you'll have to run it by selecting Start a Program. So your only option left here is Start a Program, but when we click Next, we will get this other page that allows us to specify the program that's going to run. So for the sake of this example, I'll just select Notepad. However, in the real world, you'd probably write a script that would respond, for example, using PowerShell. So I'll select Notepad here. And here you'd want to add any arguments that would tell the application exactly how to respond. For example, you could say, add a message. And the start inbox here is used to determine which folder will be used for the working folder of the application. Most applications nowadays don't need a working folder specified, but some older ones do. Then click Next. And on the final page here, you can just click Finish. Um, if you want to edit the properties further, you can select this checkbox here, open the Properties dialog for this task when I click Finish. So I'll select that just so we can see the properties. This is the task that the wizard automatically created for us. And it has all the same properties as any other task. You'll see on the Triggers tab here that it is triggered whenever the specific event that we had selected occurs. You could also add other triggers if you wanted it to, the same task to run when other events occurred and you didn't want to have to recreate it. And if you want to go back and change what program runs, you can go to the Actions tab here. And that's all there is to it. This has unlimited potential, allowing you to automatically respond to many different types of system events as long as something adds an event to the event viewer and you can respond to it by writing a script or running a program, well, you can automate those tasks and make your day-to-day -day job really much easier. This just notifies us that it successfully created the task. Now it's time for a real-world scenario. You recently, you rolled out a change to group policy that will only take effect after the computer is restarted. And this change is supposed to stop a problem with flickering screens that users have been reporting. Well, Mary is complaining that her screen is flickering. And you ask her, Mary, have you rebooted your computer? And she insists that she's rebooted her computer. But you know what? It sure sounds like she hasn't rebooted her computer. So let's go see how long it's been since Mary has rebooted her computer. The easiest way to do this is to use the event log, specifically the system event log. Let's clear this filter. Now there are a couple of events that fire every single time the computer starts up, and one is event ID 6005. So let's look for just that event. I'm opening up the filter and then under event IDs here, I'm just going to put in 6005. And what we're left with is a log of every single time the computer has been rebooted. And this indicates that it was last rebooted on March 6, 2013, which is a couple of weeks ago. Turns out Mary either didn't reboot her computer, or maybe she doesn't know what a reboot is. Maybe she's just logging off and on. Anyway, this tells us exactly what we need to know. Uh, just for future reference, I will save this filter as a custom view, and that way I can pop back here right away and see when the computer was last rebooted. And now it's time for a real-world scenario. In this scenario, we need to track the reboots in our organization. Somebody wants to know exactly when people's computers are getting restarted because we want to be able to determine whether computers are perhaps malfunctioning and restarting too frequently, or if some people are preventing Windows Update from automatically restarting their computer. So we're going to use event subscriptions 
to forward all reboot related events to a central computer. Configuring event subscriptions requires multiple steps. First, you need to configure the source computer, what they call the forwarding computer, the computer that's going to be generating the events and sending them on. And then you have to configure the receiving computer. Once the forwarding computer and the receiving computer or the collecting computer are configured, then you can actually configure the event subscriptions and start watching for events. So here I'm on a Windows Enterprise computer. It's part of an Active Directory domain, and I'm going to open up an administrative command prompt. Now, in order to forward events from one computer to another, you need to have administrative rights on both computers. And the easiest way to do that is to configure an Active Directory domain, because only within an Active Directory domain will a single user account be able to access all these different computers that you'd probably be collecting events from. So that's why I'm using an enterprise computer here, and I'm actually going to be configuring a computer running server 2012 as the collecting computer, but it'll operate exactly like a Windows XP computer. So on my forwarding computer here, I'm going to run the command winrm quick config. This is a command that's really important to memorize. So I would keep my eye out for it. WinRM quick config is the command you run to configure a computer to forward events. And you can see here, WinRM is telling me that it's already set up for remote management. If it weren't, then it would have walked me through the process of configuring it. Now let's pop over to our collecting computer running Windows Server 2012. So here we are on Windows Server 2012, and once again, I will open up an administrative command prompt. I'm going to run a different command to configure this computer to collect events. It's going to be WEC util QC. Memorize that. I wish there were an easier way. You could say Windows event collection utility. Think of it that way, WEC util, and then QC, of course, quick config. Now it's prompting me to change the startup mode for the service that it relies on, so I'm going to let it do that. And now the Windows Event Collector service is running. That's required on the computer that's going to be collecting the events. Now let's pop back to that forwarding computer for another configuration step. And now what we need to do is to configure the collecting computer account as an administrator on this computer. In other words, not my user account, but the actual computer account of the collecting computer. So I'll open up the computer management console here. And under local users and groups, I'll, I need to edit the administrators group to add that computer account to it. So I'm going to click the add button here. And now I need to add the computer account. If you'll see up here, it says select this object type, users, service accounts, or groups. It doesn't list computers, right? So I'm going to click object types here and then allow me to browse computers. Now let's just browse all the computers in the organization so I can find the right one. I'll turn off the types that aren't computers to make the list a little shorter. There we go. So this is the computer that I'm going to be collecting events from. And you can see from the computer name why I didn't want to just type it. That's a mess. Always name your computer something friendly and easy to remember. Don't do what Tony does. Great. Now in the local administrators group on the forwarding computer, I have the computer account of the collecting computer. Make sense? Now we're finally ready for the fun part, which is to create a new subscription. Now we're back on the computer running server 2012. This is the collecting computer. I'll open up the WinX menu and start the computer management console so that I can get to event viewer. Within event viewer, I'm going to select the subscriptions node here. And now I'm going to create a new subscription. So I'm just right clicking it and then clicking create subscription. And we just want to log every time a computer in the organization restarts. So I'll just call it reboots. Now here it lets me choose which event log it's going to go into. And by default, it goes into forwarded events, which is designed specifically for a subscription. So I'll leave that there. Now it's really important to understand the two different types of subscriptions. 
you can see the default option is collector initiated. The collector is the computer you look at the events on. It's the central computer that everybody sends it to. And this is the easiest way to configure a subscription. Collector subscriptions are also known as pull subscriptions because the collecting computer is pulling the events from all the other computers in the organization. The other option is source computer initiated and source computer initiated starts with the computer that's forwarding the events rather than the computer that's collecting the events. Source computer initiated subscriptions are also called push subscriptions because the computer with the event is pushing it to the collecting computer. So we'll start with a collector initiated subscription. And here we'll just select the computer. Once again, I will just browse for every computer and it's Windows 8 Ant, Windows 8 Enterprise. We'll click the uh, test button here to make sure it works. All right, so that's actually useful. The uh, test failed, which means I need to do a little bit of network troubleshooting. Let's make sure we can communicate with the computer. I'll just open up a command prompt and try pinging it. Interesting. So we're going to have a quick aside with a little network troubleshooting, but that never hurt anybody. I'm on the server computer now. I'm going to check the network configuration by running IP config. We can see here that this has an IP address of 192.168.2.23. And it thinks the IP address of the forwarding computer is 2.18, but it can't reach it. So let's see if we can reach our default gateway. That'll be a good test to see if we're properly connected to the network. We can reach the default gateway. So let's pop over to our forwarding computer. And we'll do the same type of test. Ah, so this computer has an IP address of 2.3. But for some reason, the other computer thought it had an IP address of 2.18. Let's see if we actually can connect to the network here. Indeed, we can. Let's see if we can connect to the server. And we can. So we've determined that both the computers can communicate with each other because I pinged it by IP address. But the name resolution process is failing because this computer has an IP address that doesn't match what's in the DNS. Now there are a couple of different ways to fix this. I am tempted to do something really hacky, like update the host file, um, but I think the best solution is simply going to be to reboot the computer. Because when you reboot a computer, it contacts the DNS server and notifies it of its current DHCP assigned IP address. So let's just restart this computer, and when it restarts, hopefully the DNS address will be synced up correctly. All right, so our Windows 8 computer, the forwarding computer, has finished the reboot. Let's jump back to the server. And let's test this again. Ah, that was quick. So it worked this time. It just needed a reboot. Click OK a couple of times. Now we need to configure the events to collect. So I'll click this Select Events button, and we're going to see a very familiar dialog box. Here's the query filter dialog. And the first thing we need to do is to select the event log. Because we want to check for reboots, we're going to be monitoring the system event log. And we're looking for event ID 6005. So I'll put that in there, and that should be all we need. I'll just show you the advanced settings really quickly here. We went ahead and configured the local computer's machine account as a local administrator on the forwarding computer, granting it access. You can also create a domain user account and assign that as the account that's used to access the other computers. Either way, the account's going to need administrative privileges. Either way, the account you specify is going to need local administrator privileges over that computers that it collects events from. We have three different event delivery optimization options here, plus custom. The normal is a compromise between the amount of bandwidth it uses and how long it takes, the latency. If you want to make sure that it uses as little bandwidth as possible, you would choose minimize bandwidth. And if you want to get the events as quickly as possible, you would pick minimize latency.
You also have a few different protocols here, um, HTTP and HTTPS. There's no real reason to use HTTPS. Usually the benefit of HTTPS is that it's encrypted, but these events are encrypted anyway. It's encrypted at the application layer. So you can just use regular HTTP and not have to worry about security problems. So I'll click OK here. And then I'll click OK once more and we'll have our event subscription configured. So you can see it adds an entry to the subscriptions log here and that it's currently active. We could disable it by simply right clicking here. To see if you actually have any events, you're going to look under Windows Logs and then Forwarded Events here. And so far nothing has shown up, but let's give that Windows 8 computer a reboot and see if we can see the event. So with our subscription created successfully, I rebooted the Windows 8 computer three different times and you can see that it added the event to the event log here. The events themselves look exactly like they do on the local computer. And in fact, we could even attach a task to it so I could run a program here on the server every time somebody in the organization rebooted their computer or any event happened. This is an incredibly flexible and powerful system. But in this scenario, I just wanted to know when people restarted their computer and setting it up to forward the 6005 event from the system log worked perfectly. This is Tony Northrup for Train Signal, and I hope you found the lesson both educational and enjoyable. And I'll see you next time.